Okay, this is the second part of the lecture and uh, it's about functional imaging, very, very basic. So we saw the anatomical abnormalities. Now um, I will show you the uh, more complex and functional um, uh, sequences that we can use. So we have a few uh, important sequences. The first one is called DTI tractography. So basically is a, a, a sequence, a technique that allow us to uh, visualize the white matter tracts in the brain. And then we have functional MRI. We see the neuronal activity in the brain. And then we have the MR spectroscopy where we see the metabolic profile of the brain. DTI and tractography. Um, so um, we see the white matter tracts in the brain uh, and basically what we have is a virtual dissection of white matter pathways in the leading human brain. And we use, uh, we look, it's a diffusion technique like the one I show you in the previous lecture. And we use basically the direction of the diffusion of the water to pick up which structure are tub tubular, so are basically white matter bundle, and which structure are not tubular. And this is a concept basic, uh, based on something that we call anisometry. So, arcuate fasciculus, this is an anatomical view, and this is the arcuate fasciculus on DTI reconstruction. The arcuate fasciculus is basically this part of the brain that controls the language. It's more important on the left, as you know, but it's very important that the visualization we have with DTI is this very similar to the anatomical dissection that we have on a cadaver, on a... Uh, on, uh, so we can have basically a dissection, a virtual dissection in living human brain. This is another example, and you can see how details can be the um, tractography and how we can overlap to some images that are more similar to the anatomical images that I showed you before. Uh, and why this is important in a case of uh, uh, pathology? This is arcuate fasciculus on the left in sagittal view, right and left in coronal view. You can see that if a patient have a problem um, uh, in language, so it's a pathological patient, the left arcuate fasciculus is damaged for whatever reason, and the right one is slightly dysmorphic. So this is a patient with impaired language, and so we have the anatomical correlate of an impaired language, even if we don't have, with the normal anatomical sequences that I showed you before, any abnormality. And in this case, why there was this problem in the language area? Because of this large focal cortical dysplasia that did not allow the left uh, arcuate fasciculus to de develop properly. And these are, um, this is a paper where the authors uh, show the, um, uh, the, um, arcuate fascicular in patients with polymicrogyria in the language areas. You can see the, how dysmorphic is the brain, despite it's a bit small. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so they, they, can, uh, they could not find in some patients an uh, arcuate fasciculus at all, or they found arcuate fasciculus very dysmorphic. So we know now that if there is lingua language problem, there are language problems, uh, we can have actually abnormality in the anatomy of the tracts, and we use DTI, diffusion tensor imaging, to visualize the tract. We can use the same with the corticospinal tract, that is this part of the brain that controls the movement and goes from the cortex, Rolandic cortex, down to the spine, to the nerves. Look how uh, similar is the reconstructed uh, corticospinal tract on both sides uh, to the anatomical um, view. And we can also use, you know, this is just a, a different graphic way to show the, um, the corticospinal tract. Um, and we can also see how, I'll show you the development of the brain with myelination and so on. And you can also see how the corticospinal tract becomes thickened over time. So uh, we can visualize not only the myelination per se, but also the, um, uh, the development over time of specific tracts. 
We can also do something different. This, is done, this was done by Filippo Aregoni in Italy back in 2016. And these white areas are the areas damaged in a population of children with cerebral palsy when compared with normal control using DTI. So this is just a map, it's not a 3D uh, reformat, but uses the same sequence, DTI. And you can see that a lot of areas are damaged in the children with bilateral cerebral palsy. So these are the areas of um, white matter that are abnormal. Look at this other. Uh, this is a four-year-old boy uh, born with uh, spasticity, brisk deep tendon reflex, and left upper limb, dysmorphic facies, and mild, mild intellectual disability. We have a big area of polymicrogyria. You see the difference between the normal cortex here on the left and the polymicrogyric cortex here. You see the convolution of the brain are a bit more retracted, but also look at the brainstem. These are all axial sequences. Brainstem is less, less developed in this, uh, in this uh, region. And at this area, this is where the corticospinal tract is supposed to um, course in the brainstem. And look, if we do a DTI, sorry, we see clearly that uh, the normal side has a very chunky corticospinal tract. Look how small is the corticospinal tract on this other side. If we put this uh, color, so uh, we can use color coding in DTI to identify not, not only the bundle, but the direction of the bundle. So by, by definition, the blue color code means that the bundle are going um, craniocaudally, so from, from, the, the, um, from uh, uh, the super or inferior, basically. Uh, and you can see the blue dot here represent this uh, corticospinal tract in the normal side. is completely or almost completely absent in the other side when we overlap this color map to the anatomical images. So we have done the diagnosis of a barren corticospinal tract secondary to this large malformation, this large polymicrogyria uh, in, the, in the brain, and we have done that using DTI. Functional MRI, we see the activity uh, in the brain. Why we see that? Because if we are doing some specific action, we use some specific part of the brain. This is when we move the hand, this is when we move the feet. Now, if we use a part of the brain, this part of the brain needs more oxygen, and this oxygen is actually used by, uh, so it's picked up by the um, functional MRI sequence. So the, the use, the consumption of oxygen, without going into technical details, is picked up by the fMRI. And of course, the homunculus of Penfield tells us which areas of the brain we expect to activate when there is a specific movement. The same happened with the language. Broca area, Wernicke area are activated, and we can fuse DTI so the air and functional MRI. So functional MRI will pick up the areas of activation of the cortex. DTI will show you the bundle of white matter connecting Broca and Wernicke. This is the arcuate fasciculus in the axial way, in the axial projection um, demonstrated on DTI. And this is a 3D of both the uh, arcuate fasciculus, of course, on the left is bigger than the right. Same we can do with visual activity. Left eye stimulation, right eye stimulation, they are a normal child, um, of course, activating the occipital lobes, that are the lobes that control the vision. Vision impairment, this is what um, we have in a child with problem in vision. So you see the massive reduction of the activity. The same we can have with, uh, um, in, uh, in case of reduced activation in brain areas that are critical for speech processing and pathological awareness when there is a language impairment. And you can see the normal versus control, uh, sorry, no, normal versus pathological activation of the um, language and auditory areas. What happens if we have a damage? This is a child with a middle cerebral arti um, arterial infarction. So this is an ischemia. Uh, what they've done, they showed how the motor function moved try, uh, thanks to the neuronal plasticity more laterally here uh, because the area that normally controls the hand has been damaged by the um, 
by this ischemia. So this is a compensatory redistribution of the activity. And then we have the um, MRS, that is magnetic resonance spectroscopy. In this case, so we have seen the white matter bundle in 3D with DTI. We have seen the function of the brain. Here we see the metabolic profile of the brain. And this is the normal metabolic profile of the brain. We have N aspartate high concentration in mature functioning neurons, meaning that if there is something wrong, this will go down. And then we have creatine, that is tissue metabolism, normally is stable. And we have choline, that is the membrane component that increases in case of increased turnover. For instance, if we have an aggressive tumor. What is also important is that in the neonatal brain, the number of uh, uh, mature neurons is, uh, um, um, is less, uh, or actually uh, the, the number of functioning neurons is less. So NAI is NHD aspartate is lower physiologically in comparison to an adult, while choline, because this is a fastly develop, a fast developing brain, the choline is quite high. So this is a control, NAI choline, creatine, in the neonate, of course, this is why choline is more than NAI. Look if there is a moderate hypoxic ischemic injury. Basically, you have this new peak that is lactate, and this lactate means that there is anaerobic metabolism. If there is a severe XI, look how big is the lactate in the neonate. So the lactate is a marker or anaerobic metabolism with no pixies normal brain, in normal uh, uh, MRI spectroscopy of the brain. So this is always pathological. And elevated in necrotic areas like high-grade tumor, cerebral abscess, um, in a patient with diffuse axonal injury and in hypoxic ischemic injury. So every pathological process, uh, quite serious, can give you an increase of lactate. We can also use this MRI, MRS for specific diagnosis. In Canavan disease, which is a metabolic problem, we have that there is nothing else but a sky-high NAI, probably because uh, of the characteristic uh, um, trapping of NAI in this patient. In creatine deficiency syndrome, uh, syndrome, there is no creatine, but we can use the peak of creatine to see if there is treatment, response to treatment. So, of course, uh, this patient will not have many information, will not. Uh, have many abnormalities in the anatomical brain MRI, but spectroscopy is a very powerful tool. So in summary, we have anatomical sequences that look at the normal and abnormal, which I showed you the myelination and the damage and how this changes very fast over time. We have DTI tractography. We used to look at the white matter bundles. And we have fMRI, we look at the function, so areas activated during tasks. Finally, we have MRI spectroscopy, um, where we can uh, um, look at the metabo metabolic profile of the brain in normal and pathological situation. So remember, the time domain is critical in looking at brain images of a, um, of a child because the child brain, like all body of the child, changes very fast. And uh, please, if you have any question, uh, send me an email um, and uh, um, or to uh, through uh, Twitter. Thank you very much and have a nice day.